Awesome. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. My name is Tamara Hassan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of White Ops. We are an anti-fraud company focused on bot mitigation across multiple markets and use cases. I'm really excited uh, to talk with Mayur Gupta today, the CMO of Freshly. Fascinating background and um, a lot of interesting, interesting topics and questions. There's also an amazing group of people in the room that um, that's very excited. So, um, as David said, feel free to drop questions in Q and A. We'll we'll start to get into um, the questions at about 30 minutes in, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, so, thank you all for attending. I hope everyone's staying safe and sane uh, um, at this time. So, um, Mayor, hello. How are you? Hi, Tamara. Great. How are you? You're looking great. Good, good. Thank you. Um, you know, I, it's funny. I, I've been. Um, I started off a few weeks ago just mentally giving everyone a sanity score that I talk to on a regular basis, and then that's evolved to just asking people what their sanity score is, right? So on a scale of zero to one hundred, and, and I find that it changes and fluctuates. But, but you know, I guess you know, um, in in the middle of all this, what's your sanity score today? And then, you know, I'd love to hear what you do to stay sane. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a core, but I didn't know you were going to throw that. Um, so my, my sanity score isn't too bad. It's, I would say it's in the mid nineties. And I say that because, uh, I practice Buddhism. I'm a Buddhist. So I chant, uh, at least an hour every day in the morning. And, uh, uh, I chanted an hour this morning and that keeps me sane. The days I don't chant in the morning. Yes, it would, it can go all the way down to the tens. Uh, and it will show up on my face and my voice in my life condition. So today was a good day. I, I did it, and I challenged myself to do that every single day, morning and evening. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, one of the things that I thought would actually make me go more insane was um, doing meetings at home with my three children. I know you have children, too. I have three, <laughs> four, six, and eight. And uh what I found is that sometimes it can be the opposite. I was doing um, our weekly management meeting the other day and my four-year-old jumps in the middle of it to let everyone know with urgency that we are out of mac and cheese and <laughs> that I need to go to the store right now. And, um, and so sometimes those little things I found can be refreshing actually, but would... uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, no, you're, you, you... yes. <clears throat> Mayor, you have such a fascinating background, and uh, you know I've been really intrigued by it. I, I've uh, had similar transitions into different career fields, and I'm always curious to talk to people. Um, you know, it's not every day that you find a CMO with a background in computer science. And um, can, can you tell us a, a bit about the the journey of how you started and, and how you got to where you are today? Um. Yes, I I can share that for sure, and I'll also share how I feel about it. <laughs> uh, a little bit of a misfit uh, in the world of marketing, but yes, I did uh, do my master's in computer science. I was an engineer, and uh, in fact, the first uh, quite a few years was uh, was a programmer, was developing uh, all kinds of languages. Uh, you know, I grew up in India, and uh, uh, I started in in late '90s working as a programmer and. You know, computer science in India was a big thing in that decade. And uh, whether you you knew what you were doing or not, uh, I was, uh, you know, in the latter group, I had no clue what I was doing. I just knew I had to be in computer science to get a job. And that's what I did amongst a billion people. Um, and then luckily in the mid 2000s, uh, one of my mentors uh, asked me to become a product leader for an ad tech platform we had bought. I used to work at Sapien, which is now part of Publicis. Um, and, uh, and that gave me, uh, totally unconsciously and accidentally, gave me this entry into the world of marketing and advertising purely from a tech and product standpoint. Um, and then since then, uh, two things happened coincidentally. One is the world of marketing itself dramatically evolved uh, day over day, year over year, where it became intertwined with data, technology, and growth, and you could not isolate these anymore. And then uh, just me personally, you know, there were many pivotal points in my career where I kept asking, do I want to be a CTO, a chief product person? Uh, am I good at that? Or do I want to go down this path, which is kind of a weird thing because I never studied marketing. I'm, I'm a student of marketing now. Uh, but I saw how marketers and marketing and the craft was evolving and changing where it was becoming 
purely about outcomes and and uh, and not just outputs. And it was becoming about business impact uh, through the impact we were making on human life. And I thought yeah, that's that's interesting because as a CTO or a chief product officer, I'll be lost. And I wasn't the best. And uh, I thought I'm not the best here either, but I may have a shot here. So that's how I kind of channelized. And then I left uh, Sapien after 12 odd years. I was there for a very long time. And I learned a lot. Uh, my core values are still based there. And then I joined a Fortune 100. I joined Kimberly Clark as their first chief marketing technologist, kind of the hybrid of marketing and tech, but reporting into the CMO. And that totally opened up the world for me. For the first time, I worked in corporate America on big brands like Huggies and Kleenex. I led digital and e-commerce there uh, horizontally, you know, working in a center of excellence, which was fantastic. It was a very challenging four year, but I learned so much. And the fundamental shift time that happened for me was individually and personally, the first 12 years that I, I spent at Sapient, um, I was, um, I did really well, you know, grew a lot in the company, which happens, which is very normal for an agency and consulting world. But I did not have a perspective. I hadn't had a point of view yet. Going into, you know, making the leapfrog uh, as a marketing technologist, I, I finally had a perspective and a point of view that I started to build. And, um, and I realized that I did not have to be ashamed of not being a marketer in a marketing world, that, that I felt more confident uh, and a lot more confidence in applying the engineering mindset, applying the systems thinking in the world of marketing, which I thought, um, from my standpoint at least, gave me an advantage internally because I felt marketing itself uh, was becoming way more fragmented. There are way too many touch points and the proliferation of channel. I think it's, thought it's we are literally operating in a consumer-led era where it's now intertwined with data, technology, numbers, science, and growth. And I felt that engineering is a mindset and not an academia. And that allowed me to connect those pieces and think about uh, how you can deliver an experience which isn't broken anymore. That's amazing. So, go going from, oh, please go ahead. No, I was just gonna uh, say okay. that's, and that's what brought me to here, to this, this show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I mean, going from engineering to product to marketing tech to, to marketing, that, that's um, it, it's quite a journey. And I love how you think about it from a um, systems thinking perspective. You know, I, I've seen that applied in a lot of different areas. And, um, you know, this idea of taking apart a problem, you know, getting to the first principles and then putting it back together and figuring out actually what works and what's not um, is, um, you know, quite um an impactful tool. Can you talk a little bit about uh, more about that? You know, for everyone here about systems thinking and how you apply it to marketing, and in you know how that comes to light. You know, what are some things people can use and think about? Yes, um, it's exactly like you said, Tamara. It's it's the it's the new it's this nuance of you know taking a problem and and uh, going bottom up and top down. I, I, see, I, I, I see a lot where uh, there are a lot of organizations that are inherently bottom up. You know, they, they think a lot tactically, um, very data dependent uh, to a fault sometimes as opposed to being data inspired. And then, you know, there are a lot of organizations, uh, big corporates that are very top down, a lot more focused on strategy, but very weak in execution and translating that strategy into 100 different building blocks and, and create an incremental so-called agile mindset. And the, the challenge I've seen in those big corporates, you know, these new shiny disco objects like agile marketing or agile mindset, but it's, you know, it's a cultural shift. Uh, it, it's not an adoption of new rituals, but it's, it's how you change the mindset, how you really apply that top down, bottom up every single day to, um, to move away from, for example, in the world of marketing, moving away from, a campaign that has a start and an end date. How do you translate and evolve marketing to become always on? Because look, when you and I are struggling with our kids and, and our you know and our spouses are struggling with the same battles, we're not waiting for that campaign to come into our email to buy something. You're buying something instantly when you need it. That's the world we are living in. You know, mom's not uh, a mom's buying at 9:45 when the kids have gone off to sleep. She's finally taking a break, or a dad is you know lying down on the bed. And, and going and searching. We're living in, an, in a pool world. 
where brands have to be aware and constantly listening. But that is easier said than done. And the, the, you know, the places where that is unachievable or very difficult for brands is either you do not have the infrastructure to listen to that consumer. If you have the infrastructure, which means you have data and you're lucky enough to transfer the data into insight, you don't have the pipes, you don't have content engines, you don't have, let's say, tactically a CRM platform that can respond to that user at that, at that very moment when she or he is about to make that decision. Um, and, and that requires that that's where you really have to apply the systems thinking, you know, because uh, in the absence of that system thinking, what's happening is we're all going, splurging on these macro set of technologies and tools we're buying all of them because they exist now. They did not exist, you know, 15 years back. But now the MarTech landscape and the ad tech landscape is humongous. But 80% of those technologies are just sitting on the shelf within brands. They are underutilized because we haven't figured out, you know, how to break it apart, how to draw out all the different channels, how to leverage data as a horizontal uh, and not as a fragmented piece in every single touch point. And how do you generate insight and how do they feed into your content that again flows back into so if you and i were brainstorming i'm sure both you and i can draw it you know like a systems context diagram you know like a motherboard but unfortunately or fortunately that's what marketing is it's a complex motherboard with very different touch points but at the end there's only one single human that has to consume your product or service fascinating thank you for sharing that Dave, could, uh, Mayer, could you tell us about um, Freshly and how it started, what the mission is, and where you guys are going? Oh, yes. I, I See, this is why I'm a misfit marketer. I should have started by that uh, to do my job. Uh, but thanks for bringing it up. Uh, but Freshly is a fascinating story, and I feel very fortunate uh, to be here. Um, we are the largest direct-to-consumer uh, fully prepared meals business. We are a weekly subscription model. Very, very different from a meal kit uh, because we are fully prepared, never frozen, no preservatives. Uh, we ship fully prepared meals, uh, you know, spend three minutes in a microwave and it's ready to go. Um, it's, a, it's the intercession of healthy, convenient, um, you know, and, uh, and tasty meals. That trifecta just has never been converged together. Um, very different from meal services, uh, Uber Eats, Grubhub's, very different from HelloFresh's Blue Apron, very different from Instacart and, and, and Whole Foods. Um, so uh, we, was, we started um, back in uh, 2015 by, by our co-founders, Mike Weisrack and Carter Comstock. Uh, they were trying to solve their own health problems because like all of us, uh, they were working really hard but did not have a solution, good eating uh, and nutrition solution. So they, uh, one of them uh, was, uh, you know, was a nutritionist. The other one was an entrepreneur and had a restaurant. They converged together and came up with this idea. Um, as of... 2019, uh, Freshly went national, so we are now serving in 48 states. Last year, we did close to 35 million meals to people's doors. Uh, and, uh, and this year, our goal is to hit close to 50 million meals, which are fully prepared. Um, yeah, and you can get a Freshly box in either four meals, six, nine, 12, very easy to skip. Um, and it's, um, it's quite fascinating. Um, and uh, it's teaching me every day the convergence of building a brand, building a purpose-driven brand, but alongside, you know, growing the user base and growing the user value. Because I believe the purpose of marketing is not an either or, but is that um, continuous, always on running of growing the brand, growing the user base and growing the user value. That's very cool. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, brand and I've had the opportunity to experience it in the last couple of weeks. And, um, you know, it saved me on several days of long meetings and, and no time. Um, you, you know, I, I think one of the bigger questions everybody's having right now is, is what, what's going on with COVID and how is that impacting different businesses? Can you talk a little bit about um, how you see it impacting you guys and how you're changing your strategy and, and what are you thinking about from that perspective? Yes, look, it's, it, at least in my lifetime, these are the toughest times that I've seen, both uh, having grown up in India and, and here. Um, and as an organization, we are not isolated from any of it. Uh, I would say, though, we feel that 
uh, that Freshly's purpose and mission, which is to break down the barriers to healthy eating, there has not been a more appropriate time for us to live that mission, to live that purpose. Um, so from, from that perspective, uh, you know, there are a few things that we've done. One is, you know, our CEO, uh, Mike Weisrock, has, has gone out on, uh, you know, he was on CNBC sharing about all the steps we have taken to first and foremost um, uh, keep our employee base in the facilities safe and secure, and then to the safety of our consumers. Um, as you can imagine, and with all the changes that are happening and a lot of businesses shutting down, uh, the demand is much higher for, uh, for meal delivery services. Um, and we've seen a massive surge in our demand. Uh, we are pushing a lot to increase our capacity week over week to fulfill that demand because we don't want to say no uh, to any consumer, we know what it's going, you know, what it is uh, to get healthy meals that you can trust. Um, we've also, you know, it's one thing that makes me very proud still as a startup, uh, which anybody who's working in a startup knows uh, that it's easier to say things, but your action matters more, um, you know, than your words. So we actually partner with Nestle, which is one of our investors. They let our series C, uh, and we contributed half a million dollars to Meals on Wheels, um, you know, early in March. And that has uh, that I feel really proud of, and uh, we were able to serve the senior citizen community across the country, and um, and since then, uh, you know, we are very focused on again fulfilling the demand, fulfilling the capacity. We are starting to partner with uh, with a number of healthcare services. We've opened up our B two B business model in the last two months, uh, which is always on the horizon. But the global crisis actually brought a stronger impetus to open it up. So we were partnering with a lot of employers. We are partnering with the healthcare services vertical um, to get meals to frontline responders um, who are not even going back home. Many of them are actually going to hotels to not get in touch with their own family members. So the least we can do is, uh, is create some unique offering and, and get them meals you know, at a time and location where they need them. That's amazing, and um, and it's so important right now that we're, um, you know, uh, taking care of each other as a society. So thank you guys for for doing that. Um, you know, so some of the other questions that's come up is as the consumer behavior is shifting, how are you changing your media strategy to reach your consumers? How are you changing your 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 advertising and marketing? Yes, so it's it's evolved a couple of times already in the span of uh, six weeks or so. Um, you know, when uh, when the crisis hit the United States, um, I guess more officially or more prominently, um, we definitely, like many brands, we definitely pulled back uh, a lot of our pretty much our entire marketing spend uh, from a paid standpoint, and we we channelized uh, all of our energy and effort uh, to more organic conversations and we we got purely in a listening mode uh leveraging you know our organic social channels where we engage a lot with our user base uh, there were a lot of questions they had uh, there were a lot of anxiety and we wanted to make sure um you know we we the last thing we wanted to do was going out there uh and send out offers you know for that stipulated period of time and uh, we focused a lot of conversation uh, via crm strategies we reached out our ceo uh, started communicating with our consumer base almost on a weekly basis, uh, at least for the first two or three weeks. Um, we were we wanted to build trust, um, you know, through transparency and, and talk about the measures we were taking within our facilities. Um, I would say though that over the last three three and a half weeks, we've taken another pivot where uh, things have evolved, uh, where our demand has increased and we've increased our capacity. So we have now unlocked some some of our paid marketing all over again. And um, uh, we have adjusted all our messaging, all our content to be contextual, uh, to bring a lot more empathy. Um, and I will, I will add one thing because Tamar, you may hear that and say, well, what the heck? Why shouldn't that be always the case? You know, why shouldn't you have empathy in, in what you do in pre-COVID and post-COVID world? Uh, but unfortunately, you know, as, as we've been all operating in the last, uh, last decade or more in a growth at all cost world, sometimes uh, marketing has indexed on pure growth, uh, pure performance marketing. Sometimes we've indexed more on FOMO and offer driven marketing and offer driven conversation, where I feel that COVID has really shook us in a good way. 
um, if there is one benefit that's coming out of it. And it has taken marketing back to its roots where you have to be empathetic, uh, where you have to be honest and brave and true to yourself and what you stand for. So um, one, at a macro level, I hope that this becomes a new normal in a post-COVID world. And uh, in many ways, freshly in our strategies has reflected that shift in evolution as well. You, you posted something earlier on LinkedIn that, that caught me and I just thought it was a fantastic um, look at how you think about things, uh, about growth at all costs in, in marketing and, and you say that short-term performance is oxygen and without this, you won't survive. And you have to knock it out of the park, right? And long-term authentic brand is nutrition, right? And you have to find the 80-20 uh, rule, apply the 20 rule in the balance. Can you just talk a little bit about those two things in, in the 80-20 and how it applies there and how, how you're applying that freshly? Okay, uh, I think good. I got you on mute. Oh, is that can you hear me now? You're good now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I thought it was a pretty tacky analogy after I posted it, but it was, uh, you know, it, the bullet had already, it had already left, the train had already left the station. Um, but it's, I think it's a, it's a battle and a struggle time of that, uh, that every single marketer today is going through. It's the balance, if there is such a thing as a balance between um, whether you want to use the misnormal of a brand marketing and performance marketing, I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer in that because at the end it's all marketing. But I would say short-term instant gratification marketing, which is more performance, or mid to long-term purpose-driven marketing, which is more reflective of your brand. And and what I mean by that is, if it's okay, I'll just spend two minutes talking about how, as an outsider in, how I think about the world of marketing in three phases. Right, so. Phase one, let's say the 1970s to the 2000s, I call it the, the dark age of marketing or the madman uh, of marketing where uh, it was purely unaccountable because we didn't have the tools or the means to, to measure the impact of marketing. Uh, D2C didn't exist. You know, there was, it was mostly the retail CPG model where uh, whoever had the most spend would get the best spot, uh, had the most VT ad, and it worked. It influenced all of us. We would go to the shelf, buy it, and it was a spray and pray model. But I think in many ways that planted and, and defined what marketing was, right? It was a cost center for most organizations and marketing was primarily uh, a CPG thing, right? It didn't exist in tech and the product world. I think that then came the second phase, which is 2000 to 2010 or so. Uh, I call it the decade of digital confusion where uh, that's when I got my job uh, building these marketing tech platforms where marketers were enamored by all these technologies, all these tools where big data became a big thing and, and they all had the money. And, and we, all, we all thought about digital as a thing, as a bolt on and digital marketing versus marketing in a digital world that, you know, it wasn't marketing versus digital marketing, but it was the world had changed. We were all living a digital life exactly like this. And, uh, and, and, and you didn't, you could not bifurcate marketing into two buckets. And, and then came the third phase, which is 2008 onwards with the, you know, with the launch of the iPhone and perhaps you know, Facebook in its second innings. And, and a shitload of VC money uh, at pretty much peanut price that created this culture of growth at all cost. Nothing mattered. I don't care what you sell and how you sell it, but the needles have to move. And marketing was put in a corner to say, look, if you can't measure it, you ain't doing it, you ain't spending it. And gradually, rather actually instantly, we over-indexed from a complete unaccountable purpose-driven marketing, which was also a challenge, to on the flip side, a completely accountable, binary, soulless, purposeless marketing that was focused on FOMO, you know, offer-driven, same day gratification. If you're not converting as a user on the same day, I'm not spending on that channel. I'm not taking that idea forward. So we've now indexed from that side to a complete measurable and this side. The challenge is, you know, that performance, totally performance driven marketing works very well in your zero to one stage as a startup. You know, you, of course, that's what you should have because your brand in that zero to one stage or your zero to product markets fit stage. Your brand is your user base. Your brand is your product, and you focus only on that. 
The challenge, though, happens is when you reach that stage of you know, product market fit of zero to one, now you have to grow from one to N, post product market fit. Insane growth. You have to create new demand. You have to um, increase your TAM, your total addressable market. The challenge happens is how do companies make that pivot? Because you get used to those habits that have driven your early success. Now for you as a leadership team to say, well, how do I invest in brand, which is mid to long term, which doesn't tell me, is it, which doesn't give me the ROI by evening. Performance marketing, you spend in the morning, by evening you know what worked, what didn't work, what are you gonna do tomorrow morning? Brand marketing, you're spending on it, the results will come three, four, five, six months later. The challenge is for that belief system to set in. And I think the sooner those, you know, the growth companies understand that ulti ultimate sustainable growth is, is not a choice between performance versus brand. It's not a choice between uh, numbers and purpose. It's an amplification. You need both of them. Yes, how much you invest in A or B depends on where you are in your journey. But, not spend, but spending in one or the other is no longer an option because um, if you're only delivering functional value via performance marketing and, and content and conversation, you are just waiting for another other competitor to come in with a better offer. Someone who raised another Series B, Series C, Series D last year are fearless, have shitloads of money, will give you the same value for a better offer, you know, or 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 more value for the same price. I, I couldn't agree more, um, and especially in this area, the brand and the identity is so important, and it goes uh, such a long way. Um, you know, and you spent some time at Spotify um, as working on growth, and now you're at Freshly, which is a high growth, you know, D2C company. Um, have you taken some things and changed some things, or how is how has your um, approach changed or, or the way you think about reaching uh, new consumers changed? Well, Spotify is a fabulous place to work. And once you're there, you almost never want to leave. So it's, it's always tough. But, um, you know, I, I learned a lot. And there's a lot that um, um, I, I try to apply uh, in my world at Freshly. And, of course, there's a lot of things that I've learned at Freshly here. But if there are couple of things that stand out for what I learned in my time at Spotify, which was perhaps um, one of the iconic um, brands uh, in the last decade that was a startup and has grown into a, a multi-billion dollar valued company at scale globally, is, is that uh, two things. One is that <clears throat> when, you are, when, when you are a growth company in today's world where innovation is table stakes and disruption uh, you know, is, is not an anomaly anymore, um, the only the only moat you have as an organization is your ability to move faster than the competition. Everything else is commodity. You know, there's no kind of product, no intelligence, no AI, no ML, no product uh, which is unique. Yes, you have a head start, but the only thing that will keep you ahead is if you can run faster than your competition. That's number one. Two. If you want to be a growth company, which is moving double digits year over year, and I'm not saying 50, 60% because that's not sustainable, but unlike uh, traditional big Fortune 100s, not 3 to 4% growth because that's not, that's not healthy anymore. Um, in order for you to run in double digits, um, you have to harness chaos. You, know, you cannot try to shut chaos. Um, you, you, you have to cultivate healthy chaos the only way you do that is when you have a culture uh, of trust and not a culture of anxiety. So it's a, it's a two-edged sword. On one hand, you want to cultivate chaos because if you don't have it, you're moving too slow. You're not failing enough. So that does create that chaos. But the only way you thrive in that chaos is when you build a safe environment, when you have a culture uh, which is not finger pointing. And, and I think um, those two things uh, I've have kind of imbibed inside of me because I think uh, the biggest irony of startups and, and you're an entrepreneur and you're a founder yourself running such a successful company yourself. Uh, I feel the biggest irony for startups is, is the first thing most startups throw away is the core elements that grew, that were responsible for the growth to begin with, right? Is that agility? Is that, 
you know, is that a little bit of unstructuredness is the freedom within the framework. The moment you get to scale, you throw that away and you bring that rigidity, you know, which is the barrier for big organizations from moving fast enough. And what I learned at, at Spotify was how do you maintain that even at that level and outside in, I think that's what when Jeff Bezos says that he wants Amazon to be a day one organization, that's what it means. We spend way too much time thinking about day two problem, but how do you stay a day one organization every single day? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and you know, I, looking back at the days when we were five people at White Ops, for example, versus now 150 people, and you know what I can imagine being uh, several hundred or several thousand. And one of the things I find um, is that what slows us down is that it, you know, is when you have an idea, there's a lot more people that have to be bought in and see it, and and that's what you want, right? Is alignment across everyone, and you, and and you have you know some uh, bringing your systems thinking to marketing and, and, and these ideas, I can imagine that there has to be at times challenging and, and convincing people that maybe 100% performance marketing isn't right or that these things are important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, do you, how do you do that um, in your position when you're trying to do something different or, or new? It's, it's a battle. It's a, it's a, it is a it is a struggle, and but I guess that's why we all get a paycheck, and that's why we all have a job. Uh, it is not table stakes, um, but there's some tactics uh, that I that we all are uh, are trying to apply. Uh, one is one of my firm beliefs is um, is there is a split that you think about again, going back to the oxygen and the nutrition. One is look the world, and rightly so. At the end of the day. The world understand. The world has to figure out a way to run a business, right? Uh, just purpose, just mission alone. We all want to stand behind it, but just that alone doesn't change the world. So no matter what you do, your brand, your purpose, your mission has to be connected to moving the business forward. That's first and foremost. That's why I call it the oxygen. Without that, you would perish, no matter what happens. So I look at performance marketing and growth exactly that way. There is no question. No matter what you do. You have to make sure that works. Now, the tactics that you apply is when you take, if you have $100, how do you take 75 to 80% of your investment, if you're a marketeer, and invest that into the performance marketing? And make sure that that 75 to 80% or 70% gets you to 100% of your business goal. When you do that, then, then your CEO, your board will not care what you do with the remaining 20%. So that's just step one, right? Don't flip it. For many years, marketing has flipped it, where we spend 80% on unaccountable marketing that, that mattered or didn't matter, but we didn't know. And 20% was, was addressable, which is why there is a whole stigma associated with the word brand. So one, flip it and bring as much efficiency as you can in your performance marketing, as much science, as much ability to measure, you know, as much agility to, to test and learn and change and optimize. Then once you have given the go-ahead, once you are given the go-ahead to use the other 20 to 25%, please make sure that you are using that first sprint to prove the incrementality of that 20 to 25% on the remaining 80%. In other words, very simply, if you, if you have no brand, if you're never invested in building the brand in top of funnel or driving education and awareness and not just an offer, the first time you do that in a particular DMA or a set of DMAs, you know, do an A-B test or create some proxy KPIs. Do something that will show that when you did invest there for a five to six month period, did your efficient, did, did the efficiency in your performance marketing get a lift? Because that is what will give you the runway to do it all over again in the remaining set of DMAs. The challenge will happen as marketers, what we have to move away is continuously keeping brand marketing as a black box. We have to turn the lights on, use the same data that creates excitement for performance marketing, bring semblances of data and measurement and addressability in the world of brand marketing. It is doable. You just have to get creative with it. Not everything needs to be measured um, in terms of awareness is correlation to performance. You can measure increase and lift um, in traffic. 
You can measure increase in retention for users who are consuming your long form video content, which is educational and inspirational. Do they retain differently versus somebody who saw your three second ad, clicked on the offer, redeemed the offer and converted? So get creative you know, with, with, uh, with your testing strategies, get small tests to prove the incrementality of brand on efficiency gains on your performance marketing. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, I think we um, we have a lot of great questions in the flow, so I'm going to switch over to Q and A um, again. If uh, if you have questions you want to submit, just hit the Q and A tab at the bottom and, and throw them in there, and uh, we'll start working through them in the in the time that we have left. Um, so, good question from David. It seems like every day I'm served an ad on on Facebook or Instagram for a different. Uh, meal delivery service. How do you stand out in such a crowded category? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, so we were, uh, we were talking to one of the, uh, you know, one of somebody in the VC community the other day, and they were saying they did some analysis and uh, this is a great tip, by the way, um, they, they did some analysis and they said, uh, if you just move from one meal service to the other and only leverage their free offer, you can survive without paying for food for, I think, um, uh, five and a half months, something like that. So, um, but that is so true. I think it is true for many categories. Uh, it is true for, <clears throat> true for uh, music streaming, three for 99. It's been there for many years. Uh, it is true here as well. Um, great question on, you know, how do you become part of that, part of that bucket or how do you differentiate yourself? And, and the way we are challenging ourselves, I, I will not claim that we have gone all the way. But the way Freshly is approaching that is one, first of all, we are the category creator. So we have the responsibility to differentiate ourselves. In fact, differentiate the category by explaining why this is not a meal kit. This is not a meal service. We are fully prepared. And that category at this scale just hasn't existed. There have been smaller players, uh, but there's nobody who's at this scale. Now that's good and bad. It's good because you have the market share, Lions market share, but the bad is you not only have to educate the world about a brand that hasn't existed, we are five year old, but then you also have to educate that this is real. This category where someone's cooking your meals completely yesterday or to this morning can actually reach your doorstep. It's not been frozen. It is not frozen meals. It's not prepackaged. It's not coming from a shelf. And it's a human who's cooking it. You have to make them believe that it is possible. You know, it's like back in the day, Dropbox had to focus on their free product because people didn't believe that file storage could be free and that bought the hockey stick for them. So one level of differentiation is there. The second is the identity and how do we stand up? And that's where Freshly has, uh, you know, lots, last year we laid the foundation for uh, our new design system. Um, we reorchestrated and evolved what our mission and purpose was. And since then we are taking baby steps. It's not a big splash, which is, something that direct-to-consumer brands don't do. We, we don't take big swings like that. So we've been taking incremental steps to roll it out, to differentiate ourselves through our tone of voice, to differentiate ourselves through our photography, to tell the world that we are not just selling food. You know, we are a wellness service provider, and that reflects in every single piece of content, every creative, every asset that we produce in how we talk, uh, you know, how we're writing a tweet and whatnot. So, you know, we are, we are very early on in that journey, but we are very conscious about um, differentiating ourselves and who we are and staying true to our mission. Awesome. Thank you. Um, a, a good question from Rico, more on the tactical side. Have you found that there mm -hmm. is a shift between your media mix now that everybody's spending at home? Are there channels that are performing better now than they they were before uh, this pandemic. Uh, yes, yes, there, there is, um, you know, we've already gone through uh, two phases, like I shared, shared earlier, we, we totally pulled back and CRM and email communication played a big role. Uh, and, and then now a little bit of in our phase two, where we've unlocked some, I think our organic social is playing a big role. Um, our email conversations are playing a massive role for us. We've pulled back, we've taken steps backwards on paid social. Um, we have pulled away from the kind of offers we were giving. Our offers are a lot more contextual. You know, we are offering free shipping uh, wherever possible and wherever feasible. Um, 
At the same time, which was part of our plan, you know, we've we've also unlocked new business models, which again, uh, the global crisis kind of catalyzed that you know that momentum a little bit, which is we've unlocked freshly for business, um, which again, all of these things in a in a media mix model in your channel mix plays a role because it helps you pull back from channels that you think get to a point of inefficiency at our scale. So we know there are a, a subset of channels that we were that worked beautifully for us in our zero to one stage, in our zero to product market fit stage. But at our scale now, where we are going to do deliver 50 million meals, those platforms have now become inefficient. Or I should say, they have, we've identified the channel threshold. So now we have to unlock newer channels and newer business models to distribute that. And as any other product company, we have a massive focus now on virality and more organic growth and building viral loops and network effects. So we are introducing uh, newer features in our product and platform that will inspire and drive that behavior a lot more. Virality, you know, refer to friend, network effects, gamification, um, to really help a lot of that. But one thing I will say, when you're looking at a channel mix, uh, especially for direct-to-consumer, um, every small incremental change and shift in channel has a big impact. So it's, it's all about compounding. <clears throat> compounding interest, you know, has a cas cascading effects. Makes total sense, makes total sense. Um, another question from, from Travis. S some direct-to-consumer companies have seen success with, within sports marketing, both through TV providers and through on-site activa activation. What has Freshly, or has Freshly ever considered investing in sports teams that over-index with your target consumers? Um, <laughs> I don't think we've reached that level. Uh, to to get the approval to invest in a sport team, what we have what we have figured out through data, and and translating that data into insight is we know who our core audience is. So, <clears throat> I can share an example is you know one of our core segments um, over indexes on NFL fans. You know we just know it, and uh, we have tapped into Monday Night Football as a great spot uh, for us, and uh, and that's yielded tremendous results. And the good thing is. You know, when, when you're a direct-to-consumer company, you, you know, you build enough attribution models to correlate um, uh, pretty much user behavior uh, pretty instantly, you know, if not real-time, then just in time. So, so we have identified uh, connections and correlation with sports, both in terms of <clears throat> moments and events, as well as in terms of demographic <clears throat> and, and consumer segments. But I don't think we are ready at this point with the kind of channels that we already have and the kind of engagement we're getting directly that we would make a big investment uh, in sponsoring, um, you know, but, but again, you never know and new ideas come in. Uh, I will say that community sports enthusiasts is, is a huge, is reflective of a big portion of Freshly's uh, audience. Makes sense. There, there's a, a couple questions here, Mayor, just around how you measure success, and, and you've talked a little bit about it. Um, there's a specific question here: Do marketing KPIs differ between D T to C and a B to C model? Which KPI is is the most important for a D to C business? Can you just talk a little bit uh, uh, more about how you measure tactically? Yes, look, it's um, there is a whole slew of KPIs, but but I think it's important to distinguish them <clears throat> between leading and lagging KPIs. Um, I think I think there are two levels, uh, which is very important. I think um, if you're a public company, uh, or even even if you're not, even if you're a, a growth company which is still private, uh, a lot of times what you are sharing um, a little bit outside, and outside could be Wall Street, outside could be your board or your C-suite are your lagging KPIs, you know, which, which are moving uh, North Star KPIs, um, which you're reporting. And that for us, you know, for any DTC will be your subscribe growth of your subscriber base, your top line revenue, and your cost of revenue, which is, you know, your customer acquisition cost. But I think what is more critical on a day-to-day -day basis for all of us is those leading KPIs, because lagging KPIs, um, you know, if, they are, if you're behind on your lagging KPIs, the damage was done three, four, five months back. So we have a slew of leading KPIs that we monitor on a daily basis. Um, 
Some are uh, very short term, like CAC, uh, customer acquisition costs. I call that very short term. But then we have LTR to CAC, we have LTV to CAC. Uh, you know, we look at retention rates day 30, day 60. Uh, you know, for a subscription model, you typically look at 52 week stack. Uh, and we have a fantastic data science team that reports into our CTO that have built uh, predictive 52 week stack models. We build predictive uh, reordering rates. Uh, you know, for 12 months. That's so when we acquire a user, we predict the reordering rate, which is, you know, 85 to 90% accuracy. Um, we have, uh, you know, our, our our average meal sizes because they vary. We offer four, six, nine, and 12 meals. It's very important for us to monitor uh, what's our average uh, number of meals per box because all of that. So I would say my, my biggest, the most fascinating learning I've had working at Freshly is running marketing um, as a PNL, without losing the focus and the impetus behind purpose and mission, and and that's been my biggest learning. I think that the future CEO, the future GMs, the future presidents are are marketeers who are going to run marketing, you know, as a PNL, because ultimately, growing a business needs you know that trifecta of building and growing the brand, building and growing the user base uh, and the user value, but also keeping your eye on gross margins, also keeping your eye on EBITDA because you can cheat the system. I see a lot of direct-to-consumer brands um, uh, provide or give more discounts, give more offers because that brings your customer acquisition costs down. But when you do that, you bleed twice. On one hand, you're bleeding to acquire a user that did not understand your brand, so you're pulling them in by, by throwing money at them. And you bleed again in trying to retain them uh, when they should not have been here in the first place, right? so it's um, it, it's a whole suite of KPIs. And but you know, I'm sure, um, like I said, from from CACs and and ratios. Uh, one thing I will say that I'm a big believer in ratios as opposed to uh, most rate KPIs because the ratios give you broader context. Whether it's a a mount to Dow ratio, or it's a CAC to LTR ratio, or it's a discount to gross revenue ratio. That makes total sense. I, I agree as well. And, you know, we, we've been having conversations at White Ops around this idea of zero-based budgeting, which is actually an old idea in, in, uh, in finance, but, you know, making somewhat of a comeback in the last decade um, where you, instead of thinking about what your budget was and, and saying, I, this is what I have to spend, you, you build it from the ground up. You know, it's mm -hmm. almost systems thinking, right? What am I going to make yeah. my bets on and, and what is the output? Um, and it makes a lot of sense that um, it fits in nicely with the way you describe that. <clears throat> um, so there's a couple questions around um, just logistics and how you guys are operating in this environment from packaging and delivering, um, you know, in the midst of, of COVID, um, you know, any insights into that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm not an expert on that. Um, you know, we have um, we have our vice president of supply chain, our head of uh, procurement, and our CEO. So the, all I can say is that's a huge, huge focus for us. Uh, and um, I feel uh, very proud of what the team's done. Um, and in terms of managing of facilities, managing supply chain, managing fulfillment and delivery across the country, across 48 states, we... Um, we shipped close to 5 million meals roughly in the month of March, which was fascinating for us, um, you know, which obviously uh, saw that uh, surge that, uh, you know, because of all the, the crisis and we continue, uh, you know, we continue to move forward in that rhythm. So there, there are a lot of steps that we have taken that some of those we have publicly shared um, to, you know, for the safety of our employees across the facilities. Uh, you know, we have four different facilities across the nation. Um, and, and, and um, yeah, as well as with all our partners uh, that are responsible for the last mile delivery. Makes sense. Um, so th this question is more about career paths and, you know, especially with your background, I think it sparks a lot of interesting thoughts. Uh, the question is the, the marketing landscape has changed so much and now marketers have more career longevity if they have the combined consumer and tech understanding like you do what career advice can you give for people with the opposite career path as you, I, somebody who started in CPG brand marketing and now wants to expand their capabilities to be a marketer with a more tech enabled mindset? What's your advice? Yeah. Um, 
I do have a perspective. I, I don't know about longevity. I feel uh, marketing is still uh, struggling and challenging itself to prove its worth every single day, which, which I'm not complaining about. I think every single function should figure out ways to prove its worth, to focus on outcome and not outputs, hence the question on KPIs. I think uh, every function, regardless of marketing or finance or, or product or whatever it may be, has to measure its impact. But the one advice... Um, if I can, uh, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to share, but I would say is no matter where you've started and no matter which function and vertical you sit in, one thing that I'm a firm believer of is the modern executive is not a T-shaped executive anymore, right? You, yes, we, we're all still majoring. And when we went to college, uh, you know, there were these traditional vertical silos of doing a major in marketing or computer science or tech or finance and, and sales and so on. I think the modern consumer and hence the modern executive and modern academia has to be more uh, multi-pie shape. You have to go deep in many areas. And, and in the last three or four years, I've challenged myself to learn more about finance. I've challenged myself to learn about p um, and and uh, reading on Wikipedia because I think that's the, that's a place to find definition and explanation for dummies like me. So I go there and I, I learn about, you know, all, all these all these concepts. So I feel that whether you're a marketer starting from brand or, or you're a technologist or you're a product person, ultimately, as we all keep challenging ourselves in incremental steps, we have to understand all nuances. So if you're a marketer, please understand how to move the needle. Please understand um, um, how to impact the business. Understand the nuances of technology. Now, that may not necessarily we mean you have to learn how to code, but that means you should know enough to connect the right dots. You should know enough to hire the right people who are 10 times better than you are in that discipline. And then as you, you, know, as you keep evolving, um, you know, our roles become that of an orchestrator and, and not just uh, a guitarist you know, and not just a drummer. But who's going to be orchestrating the symphony? Um, and because I feel that ultimately we're all in the business of of uh, orchestrating a symphony, which is the, the ultimate consumer experience. So, um, but we can no longer be um, focused on the vertical. I think uh, at one point I had said, uh, marketing is more akin to the medical profession. You know, there, if you're a doctor, you're constantly studying and learning because new viruses pop up. Look at the healthcare field right now. They're trying to invent and innovate to overcome this battle. I think marketing in all its humility in small ways, is has to apply that mindset because new technologies, new consumer habits, new consumer behaviors are constantly coming up. So how do we um, adopt and adapt to that consumer in this consumer-led era? That's, an, that's a great way to put it. And, you know, I think it, it fits a lot in what you're saying about systems thinking, and it's such a valuable... Um, I'll say tool, uh, you know, for anyone to use a, a, of starting to pick apart what's behind something, learning about the different backgrounds, what are the assumptions that we start off with and how have they changed? Maybe they, they were never right in the first place or maybe the entire landscape changed, right? So, um, yeah, those are, those are great, great analogies. Um, so we got time for one or two more questions. Um, uh, one of the ones up here in the last decade, which brands, according to you, have been able to strive uh, a good strike a good balance between growth and purpose-driven marketing? Like, what's a or in general, what are brands that you admire in, in this space for executing well? Um, you know, there are there are a lot of great brands um, that you see um, every day, uh, kind of evolve, and there are some patent ones like I. I'll give some instant, some recent examples. I saw, uh, you know, what, what Audible did, for example, um, you know, for um, frontline, and I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, for the frontline responders, I think they partnered with, um, uh, with Headspace um, to, to provide content to frontline responders. That was pretty fascinating um, what they did. In terms of... Um, uh, in terms of actual experience, um, I've seen Amazon do some great things, kind of convergence of, um, you, you know, growth and understanding the human need uh, and interjecting that. Um, and um, there is some wonderful work. I was, uh, I know it didn't 
didn't quite work very well. I was pretty inspired by some of the brave moves that Burger King uh, made recently. And um, I think, again, sometimes these things work. And, and of course, uh, Patagonia has, has, has stood by what they've done. I, I look up to Netflix that has always stood by uh, their mission and haven't brought uh, advertising on their platform because they, you know, their mission and their purpose, uh, they were very clear about that. And they've, you know, they've driven growth, uh, even in an extremely competitive environment. So I think there is, there's a lot of fascinating work that's happening um, where brands are standing behind uh, who they are and, you know, and their mission and their purpose. And um, I will say, though, it's, it is challenging. You know, it is not easy to do what's right and also move the needle. It's not science and it's not art. It's that insane convergence of art and science that, that you have to keep applying. And sometimes it works. So it's not, there's no brand out there that's perpetually doing it. You know, it's a hit and miss. It's test and learn. That's why uh, the, the brands that are resilient and have driven sustainable growth, they have an equal catalog of ideas that failed as much as the catalog of ideas that succeeded. Very cool. Thank you, Ayer, and thank you for all of the insights and um, letting us take a peek inside your mind and, and how you think. Um, we appreciate the time. That was Thank you. Thank you both. That was uh, absolutely phenomenal, guys. I, I, I know uh, we haven't instituted the uh, applause button yet, but I'll ask everybody in our virtual audience to, to give you guys a nice cheers. That was fantastic. I think we could have let you, you go on for another hour, uh, but we... Um, I mean, for, first of all, I will say we got some um, ridiculously great questions um, sent by the community. So, Mayur, if it's all right with you, uh, we'll work with you and your team. Maybe we'll try to get some answer, turn it into a blog post or something, because there were some really good ones that we didn't get to, and we want to try to answer as many of them as we can. So I'll be in touch. But, um, no, Tomer, thank you. Mayur, thank you. That was fantastic. That was great, guys. Um, and great. hopefully we'll have you back thank again you soon. Awesome. Great. Thank you. So Thanks,